Well, I think going into to pillar three and pillar three and pillar four are kind of interchangeable in a sense of pillar three being nutrition. Yes. Pillar four being recovery. I think it's safe to say that in terms of nutrition, there are two areas of emphasis that are important. One, to fuel your training. Two, to recover from your training sessions. I also think it's safe to say, and you've probably seen it yourself, that there are some athletes that are really good at training and are horrible at eating and recovering. How, how frequently do you see that? I see it a lot because uh, a, lot of athlete gets, uh, a lot of athletes get so hyper-focused on the training that they don't view um, nutrition and recovery as something as important and they don't see the interplay uh, with all of it. And, um, well, if I didn't run well, it must be because I don't train hard enough. I need to train harder or run faster when it could be that you're just putting low octane fuel into a, a Lamborghini engine and you don't want to do that, right? You are one of the best athletes I have ever coached when it comes to nutrition and recovery. You came from a place where nutrition was so important. And you came from a place um, in the weight room where uh, recovery was so important to be able to make gains that you internalized recovery and nutrition as a vital part of the process to get better. So um, growing an aerobic system and growing your ability to run fast to you was akin to growing in the weight room, which still required nutrition and recovery and um I would be interested from a coach standpoint, when you got um, into the marathoning space, you started working with me, what your thought processes were and what your approach was in maintaining your nutrition and your recovery focus as we got into hard training. I think coming from a, a bodybuilding and powerlifting background, one, you have to be super disciplined in terms of nutrition, not just for performance, but if I wanted to get down to a certain body fat percentage, I had to be extremely precise with what I was putting in my body and at what amounts to the gram and to the ounce. Right. So I was already mentally trained to be able to do that. And I fully understand the importance of controlling the controllables. Mm -hmm. There are certain things in life that you can't control. Mm -hmm. They're just out of control. But I always know, at least in the point I'm in right now in life, that I can control my food. I can control my recovery techniques. For nutrition, a lot of people think that we'll just eat quote unquote clean foods. Well, yeah, that's like great to be eating these whole natural nutrient dense food sources, but are you eating enough of it? Mm. And I've met a lot of endurance athletes because there is this battle in endurance of if you are lighter, and it's true, Naturally, if you are lighter, you will be faster. But it's also this balance of finding how do you fuel enough to perform because you're, you're probably not going to get fat or gain a lot of weight through endurance training. Oh, you don't think? A, a lot of endurance <laughs> athletes are underfed, right? So like, there's a difference between, and I saw this quote recently. I forget what it said. It said, Americans are, I think it was overfed, but undernourished. And a lot of people are eating a lot of low quality, not nutrient dense foods. Clear example. Like I think for at least running in a marathon prep, you have to go into these workouts, your critical velocity, your track workouts, your tempo workouts, thresholds, you have to go into them fueled. If you're going into them unfueled or fasted, you are, you're failing yourself. Like what, why? My question is why? Why are you not fueling before the workout and during the workout? And what I see is this, <clears throat> is there are many runners and I think there are cultural pressures. I think there are competitive pressures. Um, there is self-imposed um, sort of a type A approach where um, there's some sort of a sense of self-control that leads some runners to believe that the lighter the chassis, the faster the truck. And that 
swallowing food somehow can make them slower. And so what we have is an underfueled athlete. What we know is this on a scientific level is that when you are running at lactate threshold pace, which is the pace that many runners are at, right? During half marathons and marathons, maybe a little faster, that once you get to a certain point, then the glycolytic process begins, right? And glycolysis, and we know what glycogen is, right? That comes from fuel. That comes from food source. And that is what the body burns before it then actually goes into an anaerobic state. And the longer you can stay in that glycolytic process where you're able to burn glycogen, right? then you are going to be able to maintain your pace longer than everybody else. What does that mean? It means you have to eat. It means you have to start the endeavor in which you are participating, which is running properly fueled, right? And if you think that iceberg lettuce is a meal, you're going to have a problem 30, 40 minutes into that tempo run when the glycolytic process starts and your body goes, oh shit, there's nothing here to burn. And then all of a sudden somebody is running anaerobically and then they slow down, right? And I think we commonly refer to that as a bonk. You right? see people bonk all the time. And why do they bonk, Nick? No fuel. No it, damn fuel. The, the thing is too, it is not just fueling during the training session. You have to be proactive. It starts the day before. Oh yes. And I've, I've seen so many runners, I've run with runners and I'm watching them bonk. And I look over and I said, well, did you fuel like before this workout? Did you fuel last night? Did you, did you consume food? And I had some chicken and veggies. Well, no, like you need to be prepared for this workout. Like the day before these big workouts on Tuesdays, before going into Wednesdays, I am staying on the top of nutrition in terms of hydration, water, electrolyte intake, carbohydrates, a lot of carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. And in the morning before we do these workouts on Wednesdays, you know, I wake up, the workout starts at six. I'm up at four because I have to travel downtown. I wake up, go into the kitchen. I make a English muffin with some honey, maybe some peanut butter, banana. And then I'm sipping on two scoops of G1M Sport on the way down to, to downtown Austin to meet up with you guys. And how many grams of carbohydrate? So that's 40 grams of carbohydrates just in G1M Sport yep. and 700 milligrams of sodium. And then I'll have one or two water bottles for during that workout. Each one has another two scoops of G1M Sport. So another 40 grams of carbs, 700 milligrams of sodium. And if it's in the warmer months here in Austin, I will add an extra scoop of electrolytes, another 500 milligrams of sodium yeah. to each bottle. So I go into these workouts feeling strong, feeling primed. It carries me through. So that way I know that when I'm doing the work, I'm actually working on systems that can be improved. I'm not holding myself back from improper nutrition. Right. And, you know, when I have an athlete tell me, well, I don't eat breakfast. I don't eat before a hard workout. I asked him, okay, well, when did you eat dinner? Well, 7 p.m. Okay. So the workout starts at 6.30. The hard part of the workout starts at 6.30. So that's almost 12 hours later. And I'm like, so you just went half a day with zero calories. And then you are going to engage in hard aerobic exercise. And you're going to ask your body to try to perform at its height. And that's actually not physically possible. Why would we ever leave for a family vacation with no fuel in the car, right? I've said that a thousand times. And so your approach is one that's premised in um, discipline, but also in recognition of your body's physiologic needs to actually perform. And it's just really, really key, you know? Um, and the G1M sport is, is, is formulated well. Um, um, it's, it's, it's good and you got to use it, but you gotta, you gotta eat too, right? Mm -hmm. And it's gotta be a combination of all of these things that really lets us perform really, really well when we're calling on our bodies to perform in a way that's much more difficult than just uh, sitting in our car driving to work. And it's like right after the workout's mm -hmm. over, I'm thinking, okay, now it's time to refuel. What do I need to eat to facilitate the recovery process? 
And nutrition isn't just spent around the workout. It, this is a 24 seven thing. The hard part is, and I can speak from experience, I had an eating disorder when I was younger. It's really easy for athletes to be mentally overconsumed by the thought of nutrition. And that was the type A component and the over obsession with trying to be um, almost in um, uh, almost over control. Yep. Fair? It's, it's very fair. And it's, it's tracking everything. It's, it's eating just the bare minimum. And I can relate to the people that are going through this. I really can. And I, I see it all the time. I still see it in people all the time where you're constantly thinking about that meal. You're thinking about the next one and what you're going to eat and, and having to be over controlled and over obsessed with it. Mm -hmm. But it has to become part of this thing where it's, you're consciously thinking, okay, if I want to perform tomorrow, what do I need to put in my body today to be the best version of myself in the next couple days, weeks, months, and years? And it has to become just, it's an awareness thing. And on a rare, and only on only the rarest, rarest of occasions, does it mean eat less? Right. Pretty much never. And I think that, um, there's a component to this too that's really, really vital um, because I coach so many women, right? Um, is um, understanding the importance of the differences between um, feminine health and male health um, when it comes to the endurance space and physical exercise. Um, one of the major things that I see is um, iron deficiency that is the precursor to anemia and making sure that we understand the importance of it. We live in a culture where um, we um, have a lot of vegetarians and we have a lot of vegans and um, it's a really, really um, healthy way to eat. And it's a really, really good lifestyle if the diets are managed properly. And I'm not gonna get into all the ins and outs of it, but the main thing that I wanna address is iron and why it's so important. Um, without iron, the aerobic process cannot occur. Without iron, oxygen does not get delivered to your working muscles. And so when people say, well, why are you tired when you are anemic or iron deficient? The short answer is, it's just because your body is performing anaerobically, doing almost nothing, right? It's just starved of oxygen because the um, iron is required to bind an oxygen molecule to a red blood cell. And so that is how basically, without going into more of the scientific weeds than I need to, that's the way oxygen gets delivered to working muscles, right? And that is all we are trying to do as distance runners is build an oxygen delivery system. If you are iron deficient or anemic, you do not have the chance to even get oxygen you're breathing in, even if you were in oxygen laid in air at sea level, right? It's not getting to your working muscles. And so it's really important for the young women because um, uh, 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 they get their cycle and the um, hemolytic process where you actually smash red blood cells on the bottoms of your feet. It's very mechanistic, right? And if there's an iron, uh, uh, molecule that's bonded to that red pl blood cell, well, then that gets smashed too, right? And then if you live in warmer climates and, you're, in climates and you're sweating, you lose iron through sweat and through sweat, through the hemolytic process and through getting your cycle, women tend to get iron deficient more than men. We know this. And so monitor it. Um, ladies, get a blood test done. They're pretty cheap. You can get your hemoglobin, your hematocrit. And then the main thing is... Um, looking at the precursor to clinical anemia, which is iron deficiency anemia, where we look at that by looking at your ferritin levels. Ladies, you know, really anything under 30 is pretty bad. And uh, you need to talk to your physician. This is not medical advice. Talk to your physician. They will be able to guide you um, in the space of what a low ferritin um, uh, means. It's an iron binding protein. Basically, it's almost like a leading in economic indicator before we go into a recession. Low ferritin means it's trending toward anemia clinically and uh, address it because it's really, really one of the biggest limiting factors for our young women who um, eat a lot of lettuce, uh, 
tend to eschew eating uh, red meat, chicken that are pretty high in protein. And we also don't cook in skillets anymore like we used to where our grandma and our mom used to have to oil the skillets. We actually would leach iron from um, cast iron skillets, but now with those uh, with the coatings that we put on the nonstick pans, we actually don't even get iron from our skillets and pans anymore. And uh, so we just got to be mindful of that. And it can befall the men too. We have to watch it and just make sure that our iron levels don't dip because that can really, really thwart your aerobic development and your ability to perform. Hey guys, thanks for checking out the video. And if you enjoyed it, please like the video and subscribe so you don't miss out on any future releases. And if you wanna watch the full episode, go right here and click on the video to my left.